and YouTube at the same time. So um, let's make sure this is working and uh, let me stop that, get my audio happening, in, wait for my chat to come up so I can see you all. Thanks for uh, hanging out with me. We're gonna do some sound design with oscillators. And why do we start with oscillators? Well, um, I've been saying this for like two days, sound design with electronic music, the sounds themselves give us the ideas to make the music. It's not like in a, in a jazz situation where you could be like riding on the train, you get an idea and you write it down as a melody and then you go play it on your sax or play it on your piano. Like electronic music, I mean, you might get an idea in your head where you're like, I wanna have this sound that like tweaks out like this and then comes back to normal later. Maybe it could be that, but the point is that sound design, the sounds are the music. It's not like we have, we don't have a way of sheet music to be like, tweak the low pass filter from here to here and then hit it with a modulator. Like that doesn't exist in written music. So we've entered into a new domain of music theory when we get into uh, the sound design thing. So um, who's here? It's about, oh, seven people watching, cool. Let me see, uh, where is my, I wanna make sure I can see your comments so when you ask me questions, I can grab them. That looks like the stream is on there. Here's the audio on. When we get into, uh, yes, it is. Thing. Cool, so let me know where you're coming from, where you're at, say hi so I know you're here. I'm gonna go on to Ableton. Hey, Dan Pratt's there, cool. Francisco Dean in Chicago, go, what's going on? And um, we're gonna go on to Ableton in a second and start with oscillators. Now an oscillator is basically a simple electronic voltage that goes up and down. And when it gets ampl amplified through a speaker, we hear it as a pitch. So when you play different notes on your keyboard, the voltage is going like up or down in frequency and that translates into a different note or a different pitch that we hear. Andy May, hey, thanks for saying hi. Let me know if you can hear me and if you can hear the music and all that while that's on there. So the basic thing that we're doing is like in, a, in an analog synthesizer, we're just taking some weird voltage and vibrating it and amplifying it out through a speaker. And on the way between the original oscillator and the sound that we hear, there's other fun stuff that you probably know about like filters and envelopes, ADSR envelopes and LFO modulators, that kind of thing. Hola desde Brazil, hello, hey man. Ad Ad Adelta Nascimento, cool man, welcome. I hear it all, cool, thank you. So we're ready to go into Ableton. So what are we gonna start with? Oscillators, the basic unit of sound that the synth makes that goes like this. And there's a couple of different shapes. There's a sine wave that's like the most basic sound, and then square waves, triangle waves, sawtooth waves, possibly a noise generator that's like a white noise thing. Francisco says, audio is great. Thank you so much, man. I've been seeing so many people ask questions live about streaming and OBS and all this stuff lately. and. I know how hard it is because I spent like two years going through all those options and figuring it out. So anybody here who's on Mac, go for ecamm.com. First pro tip of the day. Ecamm is like 14 bucks a month. It hooks up video, audio, no problem at all. You can pick cameras and mics, put them all out there together. You can even have like separate little things to show like a video or an image and it's so easy. So I'm just like, take my money. <laughs> um, that being said, let's go into an Ableton project. And that's my screen. I started making this little beat and I'm gonna get there in a minute and show you what's in this track and how I made the parts and why I chose those parts. But before that, wow, with that cool sound. Let's start with some basics in operator. Turn that up. And let me know if, um, if you need the volume up or down with the music, you know, you can say like music up or music down. So this is a basic sound and notice I have a spectrum analyzer right here. I'm gonna hold down one note. We're playing a sine wave form. And it's kind of like one little point on the spectrum analyzer. Just one tone. In nature, or like in acoustic music, you can get a sine wave from a flute where it just goes through the tube, the sound vibrates, and it's one of the most pure tones there are. Dan Pratt, music up, thank you. All right, music is going up. Yeah, music could be a little bit up. And I'm just getting to that point, actually. A sine wave feels a little quieter because it does not have a lot of overtones. So let me open up operator here. I like to show you what I'm doing with these, uh, these instrument racks. So I mapped a macro knob to choose the wave of oscillator one. If you know the operator instrument, you know you can have four different sources or, or um, oscillators. We're only using one to keep it nice and simple. And as I turn knob one, look at the waveform over here. It starts as a sine wave, and it goes through different shapes like sawtooth, square wave, triangle wave like that, and noise. So when we're on the sine wave, you guys said it wasn't loud enough. I'm gonna leave the volume in the same place and go over to sawtooth. Listen to how this sounds. It feels like it's louder, doesn't it? 
we've got a little more happening and look at the waveform. All that buzzy stuff is up there in the spectrum as compared to the sine wave. Nice and simple. And let's see, what does a square wave sound like? Make that. It's like even buzzier. It has all these other overtones or partial harmonics that are above the fundamental. When I say fundamental, that's like the original note that the oscillator is playing or the pitch is playing. And then overtones are things that are like a quieter upper harmonic of that. You know, guitars have overtones. Pianos have a lot of them. Um, instruments have more than one just like tone involved. And you can replicate that by using different waveforms. It's kind of funny that synths, when they first started programming synths, they were like, we want to make a perfect digital violin so we can play a synthesized violin and nobody will know the difference. And they tried and it, maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. And nowadays we're just like, we don't care about the violin. <laughs> we just want to have a crazy ass sound. that's electronic like this. Triangle wave. Triangle is like a sine wave but it's a little sharper, a little buzzier. And as you can see in the spectrum analyzer, there's a bunch more overtones. And in operator, it lets you see these overtones as kind of visual pictures. So if we wanted the buzziest, noisiest sound, what would this be like? Full scale coming at you. Wah! So uh, that's the beginning point. Each waveform has a different sound. Sine waves are kind of, how would you describe this wave? If you had to use a word like, you know, like hard, soft, smooth, whatever, how would you describe sine wave as compared to this sound? I know my answer, but I want to see what your answer is. So type in something. What's the sound of the sine wave feel like for you compared to that? Yeah, smooth. Thank you. Thank you. So um, how about triangle wave? For me, this is a little more like buzzy maybe. Uh, and the reason I'm asking you these questions is because each waveform is good for a different category of sound. So for example, if you're making a big sub bass sound where you want it to be down low and move a lot of air and hit the bass hard, it's a good idea to use a sine wave for that because it's smooth, it's gonna move the speaker and push a lot of air without having any distortion in the, in the bottom end. Whereas, uh, Jesus says digitally. Yeah, like 8-bit video game-ish, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All those are great words. Sounds, the 8-bit sound is like that crushed kind of So sine waves are really good for sub bass because they're clean. They push a lot of air smoothly without feeling that distortion kind of thing. If you try to use one of these buzzy waveforms in a sub, it's, it gets kind of like a fart bass. Just going through the octaves there. Jesus said square wave is my fave. <laughs> square wave, my fave. Yeah, square waves are fun because all those upper harmonics make it much more interesting and rich for like a chord sound or a lead sound. And if you're making a lead, a sine wave is kind of boring for a lead sound because it's so like... There's like nothing to it. It sounds like an error message on your, on your computer like, oops, does not compute. So, um, <laughs> fart bass, yeah, right? So, uh, Francisco, I love those pictures you've been putting up every day with the, the beer of the day and everything and you review them. Those are funny. Right, you can filter out whatever you want. We're going to get to filtering tomorrow. I wanted to just run through a couple of different waveforms and talk about what they are and what they, how, how they have a different texture, a different application. And in the rest of this, I'm going to run through how I made some sounds, like an analog sub, analog bass, like bass line, and a lead using some other sound. So let's find another way of exploring what do these sound like. I loaded up a wavetable where we can roll through the different shapes. So here we are on sine. As we get closer to a triangle wave, it gets a little buzzier. And then up towards sawtooth wave, even brighter, sharper, fuzzier, harder, like more static take that down. And then up on the top we have square wave. From sine wave smoothly going through a triangle, sawtooth, and square wave. I think the square wave sounds like the most 8-bit video game sound. And I like sawtooth waves. If I'm, when I'm designing leads and stuff like that, I like to play with sawtooth. 
And wavetable is fun because you can just morph around. So um, I don't want to get into too many different things at once. But as we go into more complicated stuff later in the week with modulators, you'll see that Ableton devices give you a choice of these waveforms as modulation sources. Now, modulator means you're not hearing the actual wave as a tone. The wave is doing something to affect another sound. So like with the auto filter, if you want to have your filter setting move in a rhythmic way, you could do it with the mouse all day long. Or you could have the LFO do it for you as a little robotic helper. <laughs> and how is the LFO going to move? Is it going to move in fast motions? Or is it going to go in jerky motions? Or is it going to go in smooth motions? Well, you decide that with your waveform. So if you pick sine wave as the modulation source, the LFO frequency is, the filter frequency is going to go up and down in a smooth uh, pattern that matches the sine wave. But if you're using it, if you're using a square wave modulator, it's going to be like it's in one place and another place, jerky back and forth. And uh, I think you get the idea. It's the, the wave shape affects how the modulation is happening. The reason I'm telling you that is because once you know that oscillators are part of your modulation in, in sound design, you'll start seeing them all over the place in your auto pan. Do you want it to go right and left smoothly or do you want it to start on the left side and jump to the right side? How do you want it to go? And auto pan is kind of fun because it lets you change the shape and so you can actually see what, you know, you could be more like a square pattern or a sine or triangle right there. What else we've got? Oh, there's a delay, huh? Modulation rate. What does that mean, modulation rate? Well, probably it's a sine wave. If they don't give you an option, it's probably going to be a sine wave. And then again, in the echo plugin, you can have your modulators going as sine, triangle, sawtooth up, sawtooth down, square wave, oh, and the noise or sample and hold filter or sound. So when you get to recognize these symbols, um, that's just the word sign, you'll start seeing them not only in Ableton devices, but all over the place in other, other VST plugins, other synthesizers, hardware, or in uh, like other plugins where you're like, oh, what's this little thing? There's an S curve, that's gonna be a side wave thing. So understanding the basics of sound design really opens up your world far beyond only Ableton. It lets you do a lot of stuff with different devices, different programs, different synths and hardware and modular synths. Whoa, like when you actually get wire, you know, cables and a bunch of jacks and you get to plug in stuff and make a patch by yourself. Let me go um, back in camera land for a second. So I wanna just define a word here, patch, right? Patch cables are like these. Where's the patch cable? Now that's an audio patch cable because it's going from one place on the mixing board to another place. But in a hardware synth or a modular synth, you'll have like, a little oscillator box on the front with an output and then like a filter section and an envelope section and an amplifier section. So you take your oscillator, you plug it in and you go out, I wanna go to my filter. So you send the sound into the filter and then you get a filter knob you can tweak. And that sound from that goes out to the next module and the next module and the next module. It's modular, you can literally pick oscillator, filter, envelope, amplifier, uh, LFO modulator and route them back in. So understanding the basics of sound design lets you think I have a sound, I want it to change in some weird way. How do I make that happen? Well, I want a module that's gonna make that happen. Maybe it's an LFO. So I wanna like take that after the fact and plug it in. Or maybe I just wanna have a filter knob to tweak. So I'll get a filter from somewhere like auto filter and use that with my sound, which means your sound could be a sample. You could have a sample of a, of a vocal and loop it and then apply auto filter after or auto pan or something. And all these sound design elements become tools you can work with to change the shit out of any sound source you have, a live microphone, a sample and sampler, or a, a, a synthesizer like analog or operator or something like that. It becomes wide open and you'll see that Ableton is really a super flexible instrument that you can create your own sounds by using multiple plugins in order. Um, a lot of people, you'll hear people say in the forums like, oh, Ableton, the stock, so the stock sounds are boring, the stock sound, they suck. That's because people who say that don't really understand how to make complicated developed sounds on their own or interesting sounds, or sounds that do more than one thing in one layer. So I'd like to just point you at some of the ways to do that. Let's go back into live, because that's enough talking from me. I want to keep this short and sweet and give you some fun stuff to do. So I was talking about what sounds make good instruments. Let's start with the analog instrument making a sub bass sound. So here we are with analog. Let me go down.
Let me know if you can hear that sub. I know some of you are listening in headphones or maybe on mobile or something. And that might be too low for the speakers you have right now. But let me know if you can hear that. And what I did was I took the analog instrument and I like this one because it's very simple. And I set it to sine wave and I'm playing a low note on my keyboard. So it's a low octave. Uh, this is gonna give you a simple sound that's um, easy to fill up low end space with. And it's clean, it's simple. It doesn't have a lot of buzzing. It doesn't get in the way of anything else. So when we play it with a beat, slow chill out beats. Francisco can hear the sub, cool, thanks. So what did I do to get the sub? Really simple, I just chose the sub, or the sine wave shape. I turned off the noise generator, I turned off oscillator two, so we're only hearing one sound at a time. Nothing in the pitch envelope. Filter has a little bit of low pass happening. But you'll see, even when I move that low pass filter, it's not really changing the sound because there's no upper harmonics. There's nothing in the way. It's all clean, low sub bass. even when I go all the way down. <laughs> then we have an amp section. Remember I was saying modular plugins, like you get different sections that do different things. So oscillator is first, it's your basic wave sound. Filter is next, it shapes the tone of that sound. The amp section is next, it shapes the volume of the sound. And then we have the option of LFO if we wanna do that, which I'm not gonna do right now. And then a master section for your volume and I put this on unison for a basic simple sound. So there you go. And making a simple sine sub bass is so easy. Basically, you just have to not, don't mess it up. You know, don't add other envelopes or anything else happening. Keep it pretty simple. Um, for a more interesting sound, let's play a bass instrument. And this was one, I started fooling around with this this morning. I wanted to make an example and I was like, it turned into kind of, <laughs> turned into a track. So here's the instrument. When I hold the note down, it stays like that. And when I let go, it has a long release time. So here's the sound. And you can see these are short little MIDI notes. Not a lot of uh, piano skill happening. I'm just pressing some notes. How did I get this sound? Well, first you can see we've got two, two oscillators and I blended waveforms. One is a square wave right here, and one is a sawtooth wave right here. Let's isolate those and hear how they sound. I'll turn this up a little for all my people. Okay, so we got a sawtooth wave, kind of buzzy, sounding good. And then I want to thicken it up, get it nice and dark and dirty, so I took this octave switch, brought it down an octave. So I've got two sounds at the same time, an octave apart, both a little bit buzzy, doing something cool. And with that filter wide open, you can hear it's real buzzy. Filters and resonance, super fun. We'll talk about that tomorrow. And I'm doing something else to this sound that's uh, a little unusual. Tell me if you can hear it. It's coming from this pitch envelope. Uh, I don't have a controller for that. So I just took that off and uh, now what I'm doing is playing just the note with no change on the pitch. So when I press the key, I get the pitch straight up. Watch what happens or listen to what happens as I change the pitch envelope, which means every time the note, every time I press the note, the pitch goes like, rrr, rrr. check this out. This means the note starts a little bit below the pitch and slowly comes up. Now in, um, 
Dan Pratt says, when you pulled that filter down, I started going wow, wow in time with the track. Yeah, that's the weird thing about filters is they do make, they make you feel like you're, that you're like doing that throat singing thing, like wow, wow, wow. They have, filters have a super powerful effect on us as humans because our voices are doing it all the time. Wow, wow. <laughs> so music, if you want your music to connect with people, tweak those filters and they're gonna like it. Filters sound best when they're moving. That's a preview for tomorrow. Right now I'm playing with oscillators and since this oscillator it was a little bit boring, it's just a flat sound. I don't like sounds that are totally flat and not doing anything. Like this. It's buzzy, but it's a little bit too constant. So I thought, what can I do to make this sound more interesting? How can I make it sound unique? How can I make it sound like my own sound and not like a stock preset? All those things are the goals of sound design. Back to camera one. What is the goal of sound design? Make your own original sounds so that when people hear your tracks, they're like, that is a crazy ass track. That's unique. I can hear it. I know it's from that person. I mean, they're not going to be like in the club, like, oh, it's unique, you know, but um, th the goal that I'm always going for is when people hear my music, I want them to know it's coming from me. It's my music. It's not just like, oh, that guy bought the newest presets and slapped them together with a bunch of drum loops. The goal of sound design is to make original sounds that you put time into and you shape them and you make them cool and you, you, get your own sound out of them. There are a bazillion parameters to tweak in the world of synthesizers. So if you just explore a little bit more than, the, than using a stock preset, you're definitely gonna get somewhere interesting with your sounds that'll make your tracks feel custom and they'll work better for your music because you'll be able to like shape sounds that are specifically for each part, like a lead or a bass or a sub or something. So remember the goal of sound design is original sounds. Back to Ableton. Love having these key commands, right? How cool is that? So what was I talking about? Um, how do I make my sounds more interesting? Let's put a pitch envelope on this sound. Now you can hear each note starts a little below the pitch and comes back up. Whoa, whoa. Toby Williams, what's up? Let's go, for, how do I go too far with this? What if I go? Yeah, that doesn't sound good. Right around minus 50 was cool. And since I did it in one place, let's do it in the other place. See, with no pitch envelope, it sounds like the bass note is just running into itself all the time. I wanted to make something like a pulse so I can really feel every note starting. So I just take this pitch envelope, drag it down. And to be honest, you need to have the time right too. If you have it set to too high of a time, I mean, <laughs> that's a pretty cool sound too. Whoa. What we're doing here is it's, it's taking a longer time for the pitch to rise from that negative starting state up to the note that we actually want. <laughs> I gotta remember to use that for something. I think I had it around 29. And now when I blend these two layers together, what I get is a bass sound where it's a nice long bass note that's gonna fill up a ton of space in the low end. It's pretty much the main character on my track. I'm gonna be happy with this bass sound and a drum beat. But it's not just the same note going da 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 da. It's like that little pitch envelope is going boom, boom, boom. It makes it feel bouncy. Um, so Francisco said, it sounds like the old Tron video game. That could be up in my brain somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, the, oh, the long pitch up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like something really long happening. Like when those had those, like, if it was like the video game sound of a car accelerating, like, um, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So what are my goals? I'm trying to make an original sound that sounds cool and I wanna do it with minimal effort cause you know, there's other stuff to do in life. So I'm happy with this bass sound right now. And I did put a filter on here because I don't want all that buzz. Now let's have some fun. I'm gonna hold it down. And when the filter comes up, I'm gonna hit a drum beat.
to turn up my headphones. Oh, Tim Laws says, watch it from YouTube. Oh shit, now my phone's pinging. <laughs> so what did I just do right there? Well, I opened up the filter to make the sound nice and buzzy and build to a climax. At the climax, I dropped the beat and then all this stuff was happening. So I, fil I filtered it back down. And as the filter came down, you could hear more of the hi-hats and the snare drum and feel like there's the drum beat in its own space. Here's the bass line in its own space like this. And we got a nice groove happening with our bass line. What if we add the sub? Dan Pratt, your track is like slow crystal method. I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you. So what do we hear right now? I got a drum beat happening. I got that sub bass, which I hope you can hear. And feel how those are in their own space. Like I can hear the kick drum. I can feel the kick drum. I can feel the sub by itself. Let's look at that on Spectrum while we're at it. You can see those two sub bass pulses. Clear as day, right there. Now I'm gonna bring in our baseline sound. Get off the master channel. Now look how buzzy our waveform got. There's all this. There's our nice clean bass sound and beat. And when I bring in that bass line sound here, you can literally see those harmonics coming through your mix. So a question, when you use a sine sub, what's the lowest pitch you recommend not going below? I noticed some of the notes are too low to be heard. Well, I mean, the lowest range of human hearing is 20 hertz. So if you're working with bass music for a big sound system, you can go down to 20 and expect that your subs are gonna boost out that much air pressure or sound. But in real world, I don't really go below 40 and that's gonna be the note E. Let me show you how this works. This is a good diversion because we have a, a way to see our sound with spectrum. I'm gonna put my mouse on the note and I want you to read in the little box. Here's, let me go down an octave, here's the note E. That says 165 hertz E2. This bump is at about 83, 84 hertz. Note E1, and those numbers E1 are like the numbers on the MIDI keyboard. Let's go down another octave. There's a low E, put the mouse on the bump, and I get 40, about 40 hertz E0. Down another octave. Does anybody hear that? <laughs> My headphones are like <laughs> uh, 20 hertz, the note E. So the lowest E, like E minus one on the MIDI keyboard is gonna be 20 hertz. I, it's unusual that you're gonna be able to use that in a studio and have it mean something, you know, so. I guess I'd say like around the lowest E at E zero. Um, I've heard some drum and bass producers say that they produce in the key of D because their lowest note is gonna be 37 and that's high enough that you can get through on, on some speakers, but it's pretty low. So yeah, around 40 hertz. Dan Pratt didn't hear that last one. Yeah, I'm not surprised, man. I didn't barely hear it either. My headphones kind of rattled and they were like kick, 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 kick. <laughs> So where are we at in this beat? And I'm being tricky here. I did a little bit of mix tricks. I went on this baseline sound and I added an auto filter. Let's check the spectrum first. Here's our baseline solo by itself. It's going down to uh Ooh, down to about 65, but that's getting in the way of my sub bass, so I'm gonna kick in a high pass filter here. It does take away some of that low stuff, but with the sub, it gives us space for our sub bass. So what did we do so far? We had a sub bass using sine wave, so it will be nice and clean and stay in the low frequency range without bleeding all over everybody else. 
uh, analog bass. This is our, um, our analog instrument. This is what I call my bass line as opposed to my sub. We're using the sawtooth wave. We're using the square wave because they're nice and buzzy. That means there's a lot of uh, harmonic, you know, overtone stuff happening, which means when we tweak that filter, it sounds cool. There's a lot to play with. There's a lot of sound up there. So that's our bass line sound. What about on top? What are we going to do on top? How about a little bit of a lead? I see square wave. I see square wave. What's that going to sound like? I hope this is not going to come in too loud. And thanks for hanging out watching this with me. It's about 12.30. I want to wrap this up before too, too long. But let's look at what we did here. I put an arpeggiator down. And basically, I just played MIDI notes in a higher octave. So we're up in an octave five. And I did some little random clicky kind of stuff with a square wave here. Tell me if you can see what I did differently for a cool little tweak on these. It's uh, The clue is that it's in the oscillator one and two section. I did the same thing on both of them. Sort of like when I was um, tweaking the pitch envelope on that bass line. Why did I do it? Well, I wanted to make that sound different from the preset. I wanted it to sound original, like you know, unique like my own. I wanted to tweak it a little bit so that every time the note starts over, I hear a pulse to get away from a long, flat, boring note. You don't want things to be too long, flat, and repetitive like the sound of my voice for a million years. <laughs> it's good to tweak them, change them, make something happen so that it's a little bit different. In this case, I did detuning. Okay, so if I put these both to zero, it might as well just be one sound. But watch what happens when I detune down a little bit. The farther you go, the worse it sounds, right? It sounds out of tune. But if you keep it really subtle, like point 0.1, point, okay, minus point 0.11, that, that gives you a, a video feed went out. Francisco's. Um, I think that was just you, Francisco. I've been on and I didn't see anybody else say anything about it. And my monitor feed is on. Sorry you lost your feed, dude. I think, I think we're still good. So what I'm doing is detuning my leads so that these two sounds play against each other. It's a little bit like doing a stereo spread right and left to make a wider feel, but we're doing it with pitch so that they take up more of the frequency range. So the first one goes down. We just heard that when you detune too far, it sounds kind of janky and like, ah, like broken piano. We don't want that. So to balance this out and cover more frequency spe spectrum, I'm gonna take one of them down and put the other one up the same amount. Check that out. Fun parameter to play with. So let's say that one's at plus 10. That one's at minus 11. Now with these two oscillators detuned, it feels like we're hearing the same note. It feels like it's on pitch. It's gonna be in the right key with the rest of the music, but it still feels like it's spread a little bit and wider a little bit, which is super fun. And I wanted it to be kind of nice and buzzy. So I picked square waves. What if we went to triangle or sawtooth? Yeah. I'm gonna open up the release time. Now we're in the amp envelope, which is gonna be Wednesday, I think. Um, I wanted these notes to linger a little bit longer so I can hear what that filter is doing. Getting lost on my volume. Getting lost on my volume. What are we going to do? Filter drive. Hey, Emmanuel Kruger, what's happening? Can we see that? It's only up in the mid range and the highs. Well, there is a bunch of low shit happening down there that we don't want, but you can really see it's a nice, uh... it even looks kind of like a pointy sound. Let's add in our mid range bass sound. This is why I love spectrum. Cause if you can actually see, <laughs> if you can see your sounds, believe it or not, it helps understand where they are in the mix. Dan said, if I take anything out of this, I actually now understand what detune is for. 
Yep, detune can be for fixing something or um, doing cool stuff. And actually, in uh, in the analog world, the the tuning thing would like oscillators would drift out of pitch because they were electronic, and over time they would um, they would get out of tunes. So there would be like a tuning knob where you could tweak it to bring it back in. I think there's a Herbie Hancock track where you can hear that where he detunes the synths or something like that. Anyway, so detuning is one of those things that started from the analog world where they were trying to mimic real instruments, and then we got a hold of it and took our revenge. So what are we hearing now? We're hearing our lead sound coming with a sawtooth wave, our bass line coming with square waves, and let's add in the sub coming from a sine wave. I don't know if you can see this, but I can see this. There's the sub down there. There's the bass in the mid-range, and all these high-pitched melody ones popping up on top. Oh, Daniel's here. Hey, what's happening? So guys, let me know if this is making sense. Um, what I wanted to do is give you some inspiration to take a simple sine wave and make a sub bass with it, right? And then take like some buzzy square waves and make a bass line with it. Make a lead instrument, use triangle, use sawtooth, use square wave. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is like, you can have, come here. I wanted to show you how much fun you can have with just really simple elements by knowing a couple things to tweak. Like if you buy an analog synth, a piece of hardware, and you press a note, you're gonna get a flat sound that sounds like that video game beep, like and it's not gonna do anything. And if you don't know how to tweak it, you're gonna be like, why did I just spend $3,000 on this hardware that doesn't sound cool? But as soon as you know that you can change the waveform and get a different sound, you can go down an octave and make a six sub, or you can do a couple of simple things with filter and amplifier and volume, suddenly you're getting into the domain of making your own sounds that sound original that you put your heart and soul into so when they're in your tracks you feel better about them. And then guess what? You don't need 35 channels of layers of different complicated things. You can just have like a couple of really high quality sounds that you designed that you tweaked during the track to make them flow and flex and it's gonna be awesome music. It doesn't have to be super complicated. You don't have to do crazy layers. You can do simple things, high quality ingredients. It's kind of like, sound design is kind of like sushi, right? If, you're, if you have like really good fish, all you have to do is cut off a couple pieces and then don't mess it up. That's how I think about sound design is like take you know great instruments, tweak them a little bit and make them your own. So um, there is a way you can learn about this if you want to do some more of this on your own. I build hands-on session lessons, which are guided projects that you do right inside Ableton. And for the last little bit, I wanna show you one of them, because these are super fun, I love making them, and it's kind of a, a revolutionary type of tutorial where you learn by doing it rather than um, watching on YouTube or reading the manual or beating your head against the desk. So as soon as this comes up, let's see what we got. And there it is. So this is an Ableton project that you can download, and when you open it, this is what you see. There's a side panel with a picture of a waveform selector from an analog synth. The side panel says, oscillators, welcome, start at the top of the master channel. Use the scene launch buttons to play through the lesson. Okay, let's do that. So top of the master channel, scene launch button. Welcome to the essential basics of sound design, lesson one, oscillators. Aha, Steve is inside Ableton. If this is your first session lesson, let me quickly explain how it works. All right, I'm gonna explain. Here's me on video again. I know it sounds different in the audio. What I did was I recorded instructions in this voice guide track to take you through what's happening in the session, like where to find the instrument. And then we do examples and activities. So you actually, that's where you learn by doing it. Here's one of, one of the example parts. Play the next scene to hear an example of a simple sine wave. Okay, so we did that already. All right, let's make this a little more interesting. In the next scene, I'm gonna play a chord. It's gonna loop so you'll hear a pulse. And what we're gonna do is modulate this sine wave with its own output. There's a knob called Feedback on Macro 2. Watch what happens to this knob and listen to how it sounds as the oscillator modulates itself. Whoa. No way. All right, so isn't that cool? That's like inside the lesson, there's automation that shows you an example, kind of like what I do on video when I want to show you something, but I recorded automation to show you right here. And then the best part is you get to go further and do it yourself. So that was a much more interesting sound. I think you can agree. Let's go to the next scene and now it's your turn.
Play the next scene and use macro knob number two to change the feedback and modulate the sound of the sine wave. Okay, I'm gonna do it. That was me tweaking the knob right there. I think these are so much fun. If we go through all the different parts of, or all the different waveforms we talked about. So there's a section on sine waves. Then we go down into sawtooth wave, warning it's buzzy, <laughs> square wave. And the fun thing is I, I don't just tell you like what the sound is. We also talk about what they're used for. Like how do you use a triangle wave? Okay, so far we have listened to, whoa, sorry. Went out of order here. Okay, so far we have listened to the sine wave, square wave, sawtooth wave and the triangle wave and you got a little idea of how they each have slightly different characteristics that make them better for a sub bass. okay so there i am talking about it and i'm telling you kind of like we did in this video sine waves are good for subs other waves are good for leads and chords this uh this is like a package it's a live pack actually that you could download and do pretty much what we did in the workshop today but you do it on your own at home we talk about white noise and then there's some review at the end let me know if you think that's cool. Type in cool if you think it's cool or refrigerator or ice cube or something that's cool. Uh, there's my restream and I wanted to show you where you can get this lesson. I just redid all my pricing and made all my lessons way, way, way cheaper and actually did a pay what you want kind of situation because I know we're all kind of wondering where the money's going to come from. <laughs> so this is the Mix of Texture member site and it's, um, I'll give you the link in the video. When you go to the product section, that's like the front page. Right here, there is oscillators. I took the whole essential basics of sound design, which used to be one long course, and I broke it up into sections. So you can get them a la carte, one at a time. Here's the intro that tells you what you're gonna get, what it's all about. There's a video where I kind of walk through that session lesson again. SoundCloud playlist where you can hear the actual sounds you learn how to make. A Little bit about system requirements. You do need the operator synth. And then on the pay what you want section, there are, well, it says 25 bucks, but you can use these coupon codes secretly. So what if you only want to pay $10? Pay 10, you get it for 10 bucks. Pay 15, 15. How about if you're like, I'm gonna give Steve 20 bucks, pay 20. These coupons let you pay what you want for this lesson so you can download it, open it up at home, play with it, and learn by doing it with your hands on the controls. Vladu, hey, Steve, everybody, hope you're doing well. My little son is not asleep. Can I watch it later? Yeah, man, you can watch it on replay for sure. I was just getting to the end and telling people how they can get the hands-on session lesson for pay what you want pricing using these little cute little coupon codes and get one Ableton Live Pack that you download and you can play with it. So here I am on camera again. Uh, you need the link for the courses that I'll put in. Um, I'll edit and put it up top and then I'll put on the coupon codes. Since you're watching, you get the secret coupon codes. Maybe I'll type those in here. Pay 10, pay 15, pay 20. Just type in one of those. It'll let you pay what you want for this uh, live pack, which you download. It comes as, a, I think it's like, I don't know, like 150 megabytes or something like that. It opens up with audio instructions, automation in the examples, and then activities where you actually play with the controls and learn by doing it in the operator synth. And we know that Everybody knows Operator is not the easiest synth to walk up to and just start playing with. It can be a little confusing. So uh, we're going to use Operator. You'll learn how to use it to make your own sounds and come out with some cool... Okay, so far we have listened ah, to... Ah, tracks. Shit, I wanted the music to come out. I forgot I was in a different session. <laughs> well, there's no ending music because I'm in the session lesson, but that's what it is for today. If you have any more questions, type them in on the comments and I'll get to them. Tomorrow, filters. Filters are so much fun. Yeah, I know you know them from you know cutoff frequency and uh, resonance. And they're the first things you should grab when you walk up to a new synth. You grab the filters, you tweak them, and hear what happens. That's like what you do. So tomorrow we're gonna talk about what kind of filters are there? Where do you use them? What do you do with them? What about the analog modeled filters that Ableton has where you can do different circuits and get different kind of distortion, filter drive? Um, my favorite thing is that filters are so creative and when you move them around, like Dan Bratt was saying how it makes you feel like your mouth is going wow, wow, wow. Like that's what filters are all about. But they also have a super technical function. Like when we were mixing that baseline square wave sound, I said, hey, you know, I'm gonna use a high pass filter and cut out the sub end. Why? Because I have a sine wave sub on the bottom. So filters can be a technical mix tool, but they can be a super creative performance expression tool. And I'll try and show you a couple of ways to do that tomorrow without taking an hour. But hey, we're all hanging out at home in the damn quarantine, so <laughs> might as well tweak some knobs. Francisco, comment coming in. Oh, help spread the word on Mixed Texture. Steve is one of the patron saints of DAW education. Holy shit. Does that mean I get to have a statue that our pigeon's gonna poop on it? 
I'm weird. <laughs> no hope. <laughs> All right, let me cut this off before I start talking about pigeon shit on statues. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody. I'm cracking myself up. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you tomorrow. I'll probably go live again later and work on this track a little bit and show you some of that. All right, see you later.